I'm Rory Skinner. I'm going to talk a little bit about a recent paper which is concerned the melting of uranium dioxide. Uh, these are my co authors. Most of the work is done at Argonne National Lab. I'm employed by Stony Brook University. A lot of the equipment development was done by private company materials development. So I'm interested in general in high, uh, high temperature oxide melts. These are relevant to things like lavas and magmas. Also, unfortunately, uh, something like a lava also forms um, in the extreme nuclear reactor meltdowns. And so in Chernobyl, the uranium dioxide nuclear fuel melted and interacted with its zirconium cladding, steel containment vessel, and the concrete of the building, and formed this lava-like uh, uh, liquid, uh, which eventually cooled into that solid blob. <coughs> Although, um, I should say, nuclear energy is important, low carbon uh, electricity source, but we're just interested in the liquid structure, and, the, and to which, so here's an MD simulation of the the liquid at the atoms in the liquid state showing the disordered arrangement. I'm going to show you how there's some structural order within the disorder here. And so what we do to learn about the structure is we shine x-rays on the sample and the x-rays bounce off the atoms and are scattered into our detector and we measure the x-ray intensity as a function of angle. And this gives us our structure factor S of Q, where Q is just the related to the scattering angle by sine d terms and constants. So the x-axis in Q related to the scattering angle, the y-axis is q times s of q, and I've just multiplied by q just to emphasize a high uh, q structure. And so we further transform this squiggly line, we get another squiggly line, it's the pair distribution function, so g of r uh, against the atomic separation r in angstroms, and <coughs> this pair distribution function, the y-axis, just describes the probability of finding an atom a separation R from another atom. So if you imagine if you sit on an atom and look around you, immediately there's no probability of finding an atom because there's a finite separation between the atoms and then uh, for this is for molten uranium di dioxide, there's a, a first peak at 2.2 angstrom which corresponds to the nearest neighbor separations. In this case it's the separation between uranium and oxygen. So this uranium-oxygen peak and we can integrate to get the area under the peak, tells us the number of oxygens around each uranium on average. And then we can look further and we get the uranium uranium separation at around 3.88 angstroms. And so <coughs> it's, this tells us the structural order within the disorder. And we can look back at our MD model. And if we define different atoms, so the black and that spheres and other oxygens and the and the blue polyhedra, inside each blue polyhedron is uranium. And you can see, so each, uh, each uranium is surrounded on average by 6.7 oxygens. And uh, just to confirm that this is black dashed line is the pair, the pair distribution function of our MD model. And so it agrees nicely with the measured pair distribution function. And so we want to look at uh, things such as how these polyhedral units are connected in the melt, are they edge sharing like these two arranged here, or are they corner sharing like the, these two, and this has significant effects on physical properties like viscosity of the melt. So uh, actually the hard part of measuring molten uranium dioxide is achieving the high temperatures. And so to reach very high temperatures, we use this aerodynamic levitation method, which is shown in the video here. Um, basically what happens is we're, we're floating the molten drop on a, a pea size that's about 3 millimeters in diameter, and it's floating on an upward gas stream in a cone-shaped nozzle. And as, it, as the sample is floating, we're heating from above with several hundred watts of CO2 la laser heating power. This allows us to reach very high temperatures, and so here I've just shown an example of yttrium oxide. It behaves similarly, but not exactly the same as uranium oxide, in that it's a high melting point refractory ceramic oxide. And, um, normally, I should say, it's more stable. This is a special nozzle where I've cut down the nozzle to very low height. Normally, our nozzle it goes up to here, and then we have much more stable levitation. Another thing I should say is that we shine our x-rays just on the top 200 microns of this 303 millimeter diameter. And the 
This minimizes the temperature gradient of the X-ray C, and we also measure the temperature from above at this region. So we, so we're measuring just the top part of the sample, and the X-rays scatter off into our large area detector. And we use high energy X-rays, 100 kilo electron volts, to get a wide Q range. So, um, as well as the molten state, uranium dioxide is interested in the hot solid. So, <coughs> at low uh, so the thermophysical properties show these unusual behaviors where the thermal conductivity goes through a minimum around 2000 Kelvin and the heat capacity similarly starts a rapid rise above 2000 Kelvin and there's also uh, some data measurements have a, a lambda shaped kink in the heat capacity around 2700 Kelvin and, um, <coughs> and there's believed to be a lambda transition uh, around this temperature so we want to uh, associate the, or understand better the, how the structure of, and properties evolve. And so we know at, at low temperatures, uranium dioxide has this uh, calcium fluoride-like crystal structure where each uranium atom is surrounded by eight oxygen atoms in a cube, and each UO8 cube it shares edges with neighboring UO8 cubes, such that there's uh, alternating voids in the structure. But what's less clear is what happens in the melt. So in the melt, there's this uh, robust chain drop in, uh, in these both thermal conductivity and heat capacity. And the, the, um, there's also very large uncertainty in these measurements. And there's basically no me structure measurements at all until before us, until in the molten state. And so, but <coughs> there are, however, were, however, many uh, molecular dynamics models. So these are all pair distribution functions and there's a lot of information plotted here. But I just wanted to m make the point that they're all quite different structures. So if you just pick out two curves, from the one from the BASAC and one from the ARIMA model, these are the uranium oxygen pair distribution functions. You can see they're quite different peak height and, and peak width. And these are quite different structures which would lead to quite different physical properties of the melt. And as another example, uh, the uranium oxygen bond length in these models varies between 2.2 angstroms and 1.9 angstroms. And so there's a huge variation here for us. So we wanted to go away and measure uh, the structure of molten uranium dioxide. But this took, it uh, wasn't so straightforward, it took over one year of safety meetings. But after, after a whole year of meetings and uh, development of the chamber, they finally let us loose on the beam line. So this is our, one of our setups. Um, so we have the, the chamber in the middle where, um, where the, the sample is contained within this chamber and the white light coming out of the windows is just from the radiant heat of the sample. It's about 400 watts uh, radiant heat output um, and from a three millimeter size sphere which sits in the center of the chamber somewhere like this. So it's a bit like a three millimeter sized 400 watt light bulb and <coughs> the x-rays are coming in through this front window and scattering off the sample out the exit window onto our area detector in the back. And so this is what we got. Remember, I just, we measured many temperatures, but I just picked out two important ones. One before the rapid rise and change in thermophysical properties, the 2100 Kelvin, and one very hot solid measurement just before melting, 3000 Kelvin. And so this is our... Q times our X-ray stretcher factor against Q, which is related to the scattering angle. And so we see, um, <coughs> we can see that there's broader peaks here in the high temperature, which indicate more structural disorder. Um, but we really wanted to measure the melt. And so we had around 10 samples. And it took us at about, until about the eighth attempt until we got a nice clean melt structure. And so experts will know that like there's no bright peaks here which indicate this pure molten uh, structure, disordered structure with no uh, crystal structure remaining. And so <coughs> we further transform these measurements we get again our pair distribution functions although I've plotted d of r this time which is just r times g of r minus one. It's still basically a probability of finding an atom on the y-axis against atomic separations on the x-axis. 
and so we have it's just straight away we can see our first peaks um, we get very precise uranium oxygen bond length 2.22 angstroms and error 0.01 similarly we, we measured in the melt uh, 3.88 uranium uranium ang uh, separation 3.88 angstroms with an error 0.04 <coughs> so we can use this to really narrow down the models uh, that really uh, describe accurately uranium dioxide. And so what we find from IMG models is that even at 2100 Kelvin we still have this well-ordered uh, crystal structure, calcium fluoride like crystal structure. But at higher temperatures at just before melting 3000 Kelvin, so the dashed line here is the MD model and the solid line is the measurement. We can see that the What's happened is that we still have the uranium uranium lattice, uranium uranium ordering. So these big peaks here are u the uranium uranium separations, and they're still well ordered and present in the high temperature solid. But what's happened is the oxygens have gone crazy and started filling interstitial sites. And so you can say at these very high temperatures, it's like the oxygen sublattice has melted, so the oxygens are moving around much more rapidly and uh, into much more uh, many different positions and there's no longer the well-ordered cubes it's much more disordered polyhedral units and, uh, oh I should say but to, we want to look at the melt and so to, to look at the melt more closely we we'll just zoom in and look at this molten structure on its own and so we found basically one good model in the literature, which is this Jakob potential, which described most accurately the molten structure. And so we Fourier trans. This is again a X-ray structure factors against Q. And so we Fourier transform into real space. And again, so the red line is our measurement, and the black dashed line is the MD simulation. And we get really nice agreement. Um, apart from just a slight disagreement in this region. So this prompted me to go back and refine the MD model. It's hard to see much difference, but there is an improved fit in this Q range. So when we fully transform to real space, we get a much better agreement of the uranium oxygen bond in the model. And so now we have a nice model that agrees with the diffraction data. But, uh, and what's really nice about the MD model is that you know exactly where all the atoms are in your model. So you can break down the structure into its three components. And so because we have, we're using x-rays, the x-ray the x-ray measurement doesn't really contain much information on the oxygen oxygen. That's because oxygen only has eight electrons, and the x-ray weighting is related to the square of the number of electrons. And so uranium has 92 electrons, so it's the uranium-uranium correlations are much more strongly weighted, about 75%, 72%. Uranium-oxygen correlations have also have a strong weighting. But the oxygen-oxygen correlations are almost invisible in the X-ray pattern. But you can see we have this nice uranium-oxygen uh, structure, which is fairly well separated from the uranium-uranium nearest neighbor correlations. And so remember, we had this structure in the solid, and what happens when we melt is we get this ugly mess. It's a well, it's a disordered liquid structure, but uh, key points uh, are that we no longer have these uranium ox UO8 cubes. We have actually a mixture of two main uh, species. So we have uranium oxygen surrounded by seven oxygens, which have colored blue, and uranium surrounded by six oxygens, which have colored black. So we have a mixture of UO7 and UO6 uh, polyhedra in the melt. And these uh, I found these to uh, <coughs> mix fairly randomly. Um, yeah, and so uh, this is quite different uh, structure, obviously. But I just want to look again a bit more closely at the first peak in the pair distribution functions. So these are this is now r times t of r, which is just r squared g of r. It's still just probability of finding an atom. Or, uh, against atomic separations, and this is just for the uranium-oxygen correlations. 
the correlation between the big atoms in the center of the polyhedra and the black atoms of the corners. And so these are from our MD models. Uh, this dashed line is 2100K, so we have nice well-ordered structure. And then as we heat up, we get the peak broadens and drops uh, at 3000K, and then into the melt at 3270K, broadens and drops a bit more. But what's unusual is that this contracts. This bond length contracts on heating, even though the, the liquid itself has normal thermal expansion. And, um, th this contraction on heating is confirmed in our measurements as well. So this is the, the, this bond length uh, divided by the room temperature value. So it's just a fractional. Um, the dash line is the MD models. And the data points are all the temperature points we measured. And there's a little bit of noise, but it's clear that the, the, the uranium oxygen bond actually peak uh, position actually contracts on, on heating uh, about 5% and, and into the melt as well is, is a little bit shorter. Uh, <clears throat> but what we can do is we can integrate these peaks and it gives us our coordination number and we can compare the MD model to the dashed line to the circles which are the measurement and so it confirms what we can already see just from looking at the MD model is that um, when you, we integrate this peak, get eight nearest neighbors. So this, it tells us there's eight oxygens around each uranium in the in the hot solid. In the hot solid, sorry. And we usually integrate these peaks up to the, the minimum here. So we use this as a cutoff, this dashed line. And so if we look at the 3,000 Kelvin curve, so we have. We're looking at it now. This structure, we have much more disordered local polyhedra, and so we have less neighbors at short distances and more neighbors adding up at longer distances. But still, if we integrate up to the minimum, we still get eight neighbors on average. And so, we, even though we've got this very disordered stru structure in the hot solid above the lambda transition, we're still, still eight coordinated on average. Now into the melt, this red curve, and the measurement into the melt, and we integrate it to the minimum of, of the RT of our curve, we actually get just much lower coordination, 6.7. So it's a mixture of these six and seven coordinated units, which are the, the black and the blue. And when further, when we look at the diffusion in our MD models, we find uh, on the timescales of the, the simulation that low temperatures we don't see uh, very much diffusion of either the oxygen or the uranium. And then above the lambda transition, before melting at 3000 Kelvin, we see very very slow diffusion of the uraniums, but much, much faster diffusion of the oxygen atoms. And that's consistent with the picture that the idea that the oxygen sublattice has melted and that the oxygens are now moving around and jumping between uraniums and also just filling interstitial sites. Whereas <clears throat> but the uraniums are still still diffusing very slowly in the hot solid, whereas in the melt, uh, the diffusion of the uranium and the oxygen is is uh, of similar value, and so they're diffusing. They're both dif uh, they're both moving around quite r much more rapidly than in the hot solid. And I should say this low coordination has interest has uh, important consequences. Oh, sorry. So for completeness. Uh, we can also measure the uranium-uranium uh, separation and how this expands on heating and it has relatively boring behavior, it has linear expansion consistent with the normal thermal expansion of the material in solid and then it, it reduces on melting consistent with the density change in melting. And so I should say this low coordination 6.7 has consequences for the for the so the UO coordination the number of oxygen around each uh, uranium has consequences for the OU coordination which is the number uh, of times each oxygen corner is shared the number of polyhedra between which each oxygen corner is shared and so if we take an example these UO8 cubes in the in the solid that uh, to get back the 
your two composition you have to share each oxygen corner between four neighboring polyhedra so this is just a slice but if you imagine coming the, the next plane up out of the screen that this corner will be shared but with, with two more polyhedra that are in front of the screen it's, and so but when we have a coordination number of six you a UO coordination number 6.7 then it gives us much less sharing of the oxygen corners 3.35 and so we've gone from all corners shared by 4 and edge sharing in the in the hot solid to in the melt where we have a significant fraction of corner shared species as well as edge shared uh, species corner shared oxygen and edge shared oxygen and so this has significant consequences for the viscosity and the behavior of the melt we just hope that some of this information will be useful and, and put into considered uh, when modeling uranium dioxide at extreme conditions in the future. And so I just want to thank again all my collaborators and co authors. Uh, thanks to the Depart US Department of Energy for giving us money. And 